So uh, you'll need some basic drafting tools for this evening. You'll need paper, uh, you'll need a pencil, you'll need uh, a compass and some kind of straight edge uh, and a triangle. If you have like a drafting table, a portable drafting table, that can be really useful. You can do it that way. I won't be using a drafting table. Uh, I'll, I'll just be using some uh, basic uh, rulers and, and triangles and, and compass to get our lines. And we're we're not so worried about uh, being down to the you know one thirty second of an inch tonight. We're uh, trying to understand the big picture and how to draw these. Um, Moldings and profiles. So let's begin. Let's start with a quiz. Does anybody online uh, know the name of this building or where it is? If you do, go ahead and un unmute and. Uh, Give us your best guess. That's here in Salt Lake. I'm it not is. sure the name of it, but my I want to say Joseph Memorial, Joseph Smith Memorial Building, maybe? It's right next to the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. Um, this is the church administration building. It's on uh, South Temple. Um, and it was uh, built in 1917. Uh, the architect was Don Carlos Young. And how do I know that? Because I read the plaque that's outside the building of uh, the history tour plaque, which has one of my uh, favorite typos of all time. If you can see that on the on the plaque it, as it's describing the building, it says uh, 24 iconic pilasters which surround the exterior and first of all these are not pilasters they're engaged columns um, <clears throat> but I, I love that little typo that calls them I iconic uh, these are ionic columns right um, I suppose they are iconic you could say they're iconic ionic uh, <clears throat> and that would make this uh, postmodern upside down a museum in Orlando, uh, ironic, ionic, perhaps. Uh, <clears throat> they're iconic, ironic, ionic. Um, these <clears throat> rules that we're learning about the classical orders, um, they are really powerful as designers to, to understand the rules, whether you are learning them in order to know how to break them like this designer here with uh, the museum in Orlando, uh, or whether you're really serious about uh, studying this language. Uh, knowledge is very powerful as a designer. Uh, we've inherited a lot of knowledge uh, from people who had to work really hard to uh, obtain that knowledge, like uh, American architect uh, Philip Schutze here, uh, climbing around, on Roman buildings, measuring and drawing them up close back in the 1920s when you could do something like this and not get arrested. Uh, there's a lot of useful knowledge out there from historical buildings that it, it, it's as easy for us to access now as you know a Zoom class on a Friday night, but people worked very hard in the past uh, to obtain this knowledge. And uh, let's talk just a little bit about history before we start drawing. When we look back uh, at historical buildings that have endured, uh, we see a spectrum that's shown in this drawing by Leon Freer, where he defines uh, two traditions, vernacular building and classical architecture. Uh, on the one end, this craft tradition is about the practical construction, uh, a post at the top, uh, a post with angle brackets, you know, a, a masonry column without ornamentation and a simple stone wall with an opening in it. Um, <clears throat> on the other end is a, a tradition of refinement and uh, reaching for, for higher design ideals and philosophical ideals, uh, reaching beyond pragmatics to what we might call the poetics of form. Uh, 
And like we discussed in the in the moldings class, every culture has a golden thread of the classical, whether it's uh, Japan or Egypt or or Greece. Uh, <clears throat> they were, of course, imperfect people. Uh, to be sure, uh, but we respect the heights of their cultural achievements, their artistic achievements, their architectural achievements. And in the U.S., our classical tradition uh, runs back to ancient Greece and Rome. And uh, we can see throughout history that the classical is like a perennial. Uh, it keeps coming back because uh, it has this timeless quality. It's connected to ideas and principles that endure uh, across generations. And each time it comes back uh, and each place, it is changed uh, by the particular needs of that time and place. Uh, but these classical principles transcend uh, fashion and style, like the architect Stephen Sims has written. Uh, <clears throat> sorry, I'll go back. He said, classicism is not a style, it's a body of knowledge, both theoretical and practical. As such, it can be learned, expanded, and adapted uh, <clears throat> to changing conditions. It's written in books and embodied in buildings spanning two and a half millennia, and it is still incomplete. The future of the classical tradition is in the hands of those who, like the architects of the Italian Renaissance, know that what humans have done excellently, uh, they can do again. So <clears throat> we're drawing the Ionic order tonight. And if we look back at historic examples of the Ionic, uh, we actually find that not everyone is exactly the same. Um, it would be interesting to take a poll of uh, everyone in the class um, here, but this this troubles some people, and I don't know how it sits with you that not every example of the Ionic uh, order is exactly the same. Uh, some people have questioned that uh, if it's not an absolute rule, if these uh, rules of how to draw it are not absolute, perfectly consistent every time, then why bother even learning? Uh, or maybe put in a little different way, a little more positive way. Um, I had someone who follows us on Instagram ask, uh, so if there is this variation, then which is the best? Right? Which is the best reference for classical proportions uh, and measurement? Well, it depends on what you mean by best. Uh, you have all these authors from ancient to modern times, uh, Vitruvius, Vignola, Palladio, and together they could be considered uh, authorities or a canon of classical architecture, but which is the best? It's kind of like asking uh, which is the best human body? Um, besides my amazing dad bod that I have, um, there are a lot of good bods out there. Uh, <laughs> different bodies are good for different things, right? Uh, these are all specialized athletes in this image. And <clears throat> They're some of the best at what they do. So a body is best if it performs its function well. And uh, there are a variety of purposes and a variety of body types. Uh, and our minds are actually really good at, at uh, recognizing all of these as human bodies, even though they differ in significant ways, in height and weight and uh, gender, we're pretty good at not getting confused uh, between a human body and something else, like uh, a piece of cheesecake or something. We we know what a human body is when we see it. And just in a similar way, right, there are uh, vernacular ways of detailing a column and a beam, an amazing variety of ways, actually. And <clears throat> there are more classical ways. So we have the five classical orders, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, uh, Corinthian, and Composite, or, or Roman. Th these are like paradigms, 
or uh, archetypes, if you will, of beautiful design and proportion. Um, to use any variation of them today is to enter into a dialogue with the past and a dialogue between the specific and the universal. Uh, just like each of us is a unique individual, uh, and yet in a bigger sense, we each represent the story of humanity. Uh, a work of architecture with this classic spirit uh, that loves permanence and continuity connects us with the past, even though it is unique. And, and that's the most exciting thing about design, I think, to participate in that uh, great design conversation throughout the ages. And we get to write the next chapter and decide what classical architecture in the 21st century uh, looks like. Um, so the first step uh, is to study these forms, the geometry and proportion behind them. And then as we get more familiar uh, and have more practice, we'll become more skilled at tailoring our design specifically uh, for its purpose. Uh, we're drawing the ionic column in a tablature tonight. It's a column that goes back. Uh, it's a column that goes uh, back to uh, around 550 BC in what was now uh, Southwest Turkey, but at the time it was called Ionia by the, the Greek colonists who were there. And the Ionians uh, developed particular types of capitals with this uh, spiraling uh, volute or spiral shape, that is its distinguishing uh, feature. So we'll talk about uh, drawing that volute and learn uh, one method for how to do that. There are other methods and it's a very sculptural form. And so there's open to individual interpretations uh, with, that, with that form you see here. The method and proportions that we're using for our class come to us through the Italian Renaissance and then through different authors in England and the United States uh, with a book called The American Vignola uh, by William Ware, first published in 1902. The Institute of Classical Architecture and Art developed a step-by-step -step method uh, based on these authors. So the ICA plates that you have are a synthesis. It's like taking you know, 10 different recipes for chocolate cake and selecting what works consistently and best every time. Is it the only way to draw them? No. Uh, this is uh, a system that's easy to understand. Uh, it's easy to apply in design. And it's tried and, and it's proven. So uh, like we know from other professions like uh, cooking or, or heart surgery, uh, it's wise to resist that natural urge to just invent uh, until you've tried things for a while and had some practice. So once, once you've mastered uh, these drawing methods, then you'll see ways to change them and be creative without being uh, naive or making a fool of yourself. So let's go ahead and uh, start our first drawing, uh, the block order. This is the uh, ICAA plate on the left and my drawing here on the right. And I will take you through a, a step by step uh, of how to draw this. So you can see on, on the left-hand side, just uh, something that we're gonna use in all of these drawings uh, are, is making these divisions. So we're gonna divide heights by uh, different parts. And uh, I'll call these proportional rulers. So uh, you can see on my drawing here on the ICA plates, these different proportional rulers, which we'll draw uh, as we go. And uh, then the final drawing will have those proportional rulers on the left, some numbers and some uh, labels, and then our drawing here uh, on the right. Um, this is how the, the first one will look, the, the layout or the, uh, the block order for the ionic. And um, it's kind of like uh, writing uh, an outline for an essay. Some of the uh, information is, is missing. We'll fill in later uh, the capital of the column, the base of the column, and, and all of these moldings of the entablature. Uh, we're just blocking out the proportions of it. And then the other drawings we'll do are the, the capital and the base uh, and the entablature. Okay, so I'm going to 
uh, switch over to uh, my other camera here. So for our uh, our drawing here, I'm going to jump back and forth between my uh, PowerPoint and the uh, and the overhead camera. This is the first step that we're going to do on our way to this drawing here. Uh, the first thing that we need to do is we need to divide the whole height um, into uh, five parts. Uh, it's, it's like we did with the Doric, if you were on the, uh, the Doric order class, we're going to uh, have part of this elevation be that will be the uh, in temperature and the ratio drawing uh, our drawing film will sit on a base and it really doesn't matter you may have a larger sheet of paper than me uh, your sketchbook you may have i'm using an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper but uh, what we want to do is uh, decide on a height for our, our overall drawing. And um, wherever you'd like to detail, and so it doesn't get too small, probably you want to try and pretty much fill like an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper, pretty close to the top. But we're doing this by proportion and not by absolute measurement. So whatever height that is, we need to divide it into five equal parts. Um, and <clears throat> you can take your scale. And <clears throat> one trick you can do is to find uh, a scale on here that's easily divisible into five. Um, I have it. So you can see on, on my ruler here, um, overall, my dimension is a little bit taller than uh, uh, eight inches. I've got it like eight and three quarters, doesn't matter. But if I tip my um, scale, I can get it so it has zero at the bottom and 10 at the top. So Find a scale that you can divide this up into uh, five equal parts. And since I've got mine from zero to 10, that means I'm going to make a mark every two. I'm going to make it a two, uh, four, six, eight, and 10. And then I'll take those uh, lines across. And this will be my first uh, proportional ruler that I'm making. I'll make a parallel line to that first one over here on the left. And I'm going to darken in That one, the one at the top, and the one at the bottom. Um, to make it clear so you can see it, I'll just shade in every other one of these. Then we'll add a label. These first four here, this is the column. And the one at the top 
is the entablature. So it's like a punctuation at the top of uh, our column. This is the vertical support, and uh, the entablature is the horizontal uh, beam on top of that. Please let me know if I go too fast or if I'm going painfully slow, I can, I can speed up or slow down. When we learned the Doric order last time, we drew it at uh, a certain ratio of its width to height. Uh, it was eight diameters tall is how we drew the Doric order. And if you <clears throat> have seen those parallel of the orders where they have them lined up, they get progressively more slender from the Doric, the Ionic to Corinthian. And the Ionic we're going to draw as uh, nine diameters tall. So it's, it's a little bit skinnier than, than the Doric order. And the, the way that we uh, figure that out is we're going to divide that column height into nine parts. And then one of, that, uh, one of those parts will be the uh, diameter. And then at the top, the entablature, we're going to divide into uh, an architrave, a frieze, and a cornice. They're roughly divided into thirds, but they're given a little bit of uh, inflection. So the cornice is a little bit bigger than the frieze, a little bit bigger than the architrave with the ionic order. Uh, you can see at the top there. So uh, the entablature will divide into 18 parts. We'll give seven to the cornice, six to the frieze, and five to the architrave. So let's go ahead and do that together. We need to find uh, something on our scale that can divide this height of the column uh, into nine. That could be a little bit tricky. Let's see if we try a few different uh, sides of my architect's scale here. Um, <clears throat> If I not not quite, uh, that one works. So on on my scale, this works out. So I've got a zero at the top and forty five down here. So if I do do every five uh, every every five uh, on this scale, that would divide into nine. Let's see if there's one that's even a little bit. Uh, easier. It's not quite, that one doesn't quite work. Maybe that's the best one for me. I'm going to try that one. So you'll, you'll need to find one that you can divide into five or you can, you can measure it and uh, do it with a calculator. So you could just measure the height that you have. Uh, and divide it into nine, but I'm doing it this graphic way where I've got my scale laid out and every five, I'm gonna make a mark. There's five, there's 10, there's 15, uh, 20, there's 25, 30, 35, 40, and 45. Uh, <clears throat> so I know that, and I can bring all of those uh, lines across and make my graphic, uh, my proportional ruler, graphic scale over on the left-hand side. And one of those is going to be uh, the size of my column diameter. So I'll, I'll make that next proportional ruler next to my first one and darken those in so it's a little bit clearer. So 
So that first one we had uh, four to one. This one we're dividing into nine parts. And let's give our column a center line. So somewhere off to the right, we're gonna draw in a, a center line for our column. It's often a, a long dash, short dash. That's our center line. Uh, <clears throat> And uh, we need to figure out the, uh, the, we need to be able to draw a, a circle right there. Um, you can either use your drafting tools, you know, you could use a, a 45 and then a 45 going the other way um, to find the, the center. Or you can do it by, uh, by eye. And then take your compass and you'll draw that column diameter. I'm just a little bit off. It's tricky at a small scale. Uh, there's our column diameter. And then, <clears throat> so let's darken in that line to make that clear. Just one of those parts is one, one ninth of the height, right? So that's gonna be the height of our column diameter. And then at the top, uh, we have this entablature that we need to divide into 18 parts. So I need to find uh, something on my scale that could be uh, divided into 18 parts. Let's see if my 330 seconds will work. Almost exactly, actually, but not quite. So I'm gonna use the, uh, the other side and, and tip it. I can be more accurate. Okay, so there's uh, my 18 parts, and I'm going to make a, a tick mark at, at every one. So I've divided that height into uh, 18 parts. And remember the cornice is going to be seven of those. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. That's the cornice. And then freeze is six. One, two, three, four, five, six. And the remaining one, two, three, four, five is the architrave. So I can draw that scale over here. And I'm just going to uh, transfer these marks over here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three, four, five, six, seven uh, is the cornice. So I'll write 18 over here. That's what I divided it into. And then I get uh, six over here. Let's see. Let's pull these over from there. One, two, three, four. Five, six is the freeze. 
and the remaining five are the architraves. One, two, three, four, five. All right. The next step is to define the edges of our column and the height of our base and capital. So we've got the diameter already drawn. We're going to take those uh, two uh, sides, the left and right. We're going to draw those lines up. And the base of our ionic column is going to be one half of a diameter. We're using this proportional system as based on Vignola, where everything is related to the diameter of the column. Uh, and so the base is going to be uh, one half diameter tall. And the capital, we're going to put uh, actually two different lines up here. One's going to be uh, a dashed line, and one's going to be uh, a, a solid line. The, we're going to divide D into three parts for the capital and put a line at a third and a line uh, at a half. And those lines we'll use later on. Uh, you'll see when we draw the capital. And then we're also here on the right hand side going to do our diagram for entesis, which we talked about last time with the Doric order, where one third of the column is vertical, it's just a straight like cylinder shape and then the upper two thirds has a tapering or an entesis, uh, they call it. So coming back to our drawing here, let's uh, let's draw in the two sides of our column. This would be the the left edge and the right edge of your circle. That's the width of our column going up. Over here with the base, we're going to divide uh, one diameter into in half. So find something that you can divide into two. Your eyes actually pretty good at dividing something into two as well. So if you want to. Just use your eye. It actually is good to practice these divisions by eye as well. So half of a diameter right there. Divide that into two and <clears throat> take that line across. It's better. That's going to be the height of our base. And then at the top, we need to divide this into thirds. So right there is, uh, is six for me. So if I do one every other tick mark, divide that into thirds. And we'll take that top one across as a solid line for the capital. And then right in the middle there, we'll take that across as a dashed line. And those lines will help us to draw the capital later on.
let's do our antithesis. <clears throat> By dividing the column into thirds, the, that whole height, find something that you can divide into, uh, into three. Let's see if I've got something here that works. Almost. This is a tricky one for me. I don't have a one that's really easy to find. Let's do. Let's do just my inches. Uh, there's there's zero at the top and nine at the bottom, so I can divide that. So three, six, and and nine. And those you can also take from your uh, division into nine parts on, on the left. So three of them, top three and the bottom three. One third of our column height will be straight and vertical. So I'm going to write one third of the height is straight. And then the rest, all right, emphasis. Is anyone falling behind? Is that uh, a good pace for everybody? How are we doing so far? Please let me know if I'm going too fast or, or going too slow. But that's what you should have so far on your drawing. We've blocked out the, the height of the column, the height of the entablature. It's uh, three parts, architrave, frieze, and cornice. And um, the width of our column all the way up. And uh, defined where the emphasis is. Uh, final step. We need to draw the edge of our of our uh, entablature show where that edge is, and we need to uh, attempt to draw in this antithesis. And we're working on a pretty small scale, so uh, <laughs> we're not so concerned about being uh, accurate down to like the microscope level, but let's we'll try to be uh, accurate as we're doing this. Uh, when you're drawing these things uh, quickly as a sketch, uh, you can use a freehand uh, sketch method. What we need to do is bring the diameter from a full diameter, 1D, down to 5 sixths of D at the top. And so there's, there's a method to uh, doing that. There are actually different methods when you're drawing this in AutoCAD or you're working with a contractor who's doing shop drawings. This is something that uh, you may have to help uh, define how to do this. But this method uh, is uh, blown up a little bit larger here, where uh, right at the point where it, it starts to taper at that one third point of the, of the column, we're going to draw a half circle, a half diameter. And we're going to find five, six diameter at the top. And we're going to divide from that 5, 6, D down to where it starts to taper. We're going to divide that into six parts. And we're going to drop those verticals down. And where those cross our circle, we're going to divide that into six parts. And then bring those lines up and 
where those are going to cross our divisions and uh, define this curve from a full diameter down here to 5, 6, D. So here's how uh, it will kind of look with that uh, half diameter drawn down here, or 5, 6, D at the top, and then we're dividing that into six parts and finding those points. Let's let's draw it together. Um, actually, let's yeah. So let's start with uh, finding five six of our diameter. So if you did a, a whole uh, number for your diameter and and measured it, then um, you can just do it by arithmetic. Uh, but if like me, you just chose a height, then you'll need to. Uh, divide your diameter here. This is the point at which it starts to uh, taper. You're going to need to divide that into six. And mine is actually almost perfectly on the uh, one eighth scale, but I'm going to tip it a little bit. I'm going to divide that into six parts, try to get it accurate because I'm working at a small scale here. One, two, three four, five, six. Okay, so uh, I can make a little proportional ruler down here with one, two, three, four, five, six. Now, if I want it to be five, six at the top, I need to take the same amount off on the left and on the right. So I'm gonna divide each of those ones on the side in half. Take that line up here, just lightly. And the one on the other side. So that I have this at the top is five six my diameter. Take your compass and place the point in the center down here at the top of that straight part of the column where it starts it's going to start to taper. And this is going to get very small. So small, it's almost not possible to draw with our tools. But you can see that point right there at five, six, where that drops down and it crosses that circle that we made. We're going to take that line. that height. And from there to the bottom, we're going to divide that into six parts. So really at this point, I'm just doing it by I, one, two, three, four, five, six. I can zoom in my camera to get that a little bit closer. See what I'm doing. So where that five sixth uh, <clears throat> diameter came down and crossed my circle, I bring that over and divide into six parts and I'll take each of those across where it hits my circle. We're really getting so small here. Uh, <clears throat> I need to take the the height from that point where it starts to taper to the bottom of my, um, actually I'll use this dashed line. We'll call that the bottom of the, the capital. And I need to divide that into six parts. Let's find a good scale to do that. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, 
two, three, four, five, six. And <clears throat> the way that you can do this is you would take each of these points where that is crossing uh, the circle and bring those lines up. And it's getting so small, it's kind of ridiculous. It's too small for me to even really do, but I can carry my uh, six divisions that I made going up one, two, three, four, five, six. And what I would do is each time, each point at which these cross, is going to be a point on that, that curve. So up here, we're at, at five sixths, and then it's coming out and just slowly getting closer to the full diameter at the bottom. When I'm drawing it by hand, a trick that I like to use, I'll go from the other side, is to just place my pencil point against the edge of the triangle and slowly angle it. So it's angled a little more at the bottom. And then as I'm coming up, I tip it so that the point gets closer and closer to the edge of the triangle. The point is that the diameter of the column is not constant. It changes as it goes up. It's not a cylinder. And so on the on the other side, I'll do the same thing in reverse, tipping the pencil more and more. as it goes up. Now the <clears throat> entablature is not going to be aligned with my full diameter. It will be aligned with the 5 6 D. It's going to align with the neck of the column. And the architrave and the frieze are fairly vertical from that. And then the cornice comes out at a 45 degree angle. To the top. Let's, let's darken the sides of the column at the bottom. So it reads a little bit better. And, and that's it. You've completed the first drawing of this evening. So you should have something that uh, looks like that. Any questions? Anybody get, uh, get lost along the way? I'll leave that up for a second and let everybody get uh, get caught up. Um, so uh, this this is a really important uh, drawing. Um, we're only doing the Doric and the Ionic orders this year, uh, but this is a a plate from the ICAA that shows the proportions of uh, all of the orders, Tuscan, Doric, Ionic, Corinthian, Composite, and gives the overall, you know, the names of all of these parts here. 
uh, the column and the entablature, and if you wanted to use a, a pedestal, and the proportions that you would use for each one. So we did the Doric, which is eight diameters tall, and uh, the entablature is always one quarter of the column height, so it has that ratio of uh, one to four. So with the Doric, the column is eight diameters tall. That makes the uh, entablature two diameters tall. And the architrave, frieze, and the cornice were divided like this. You can see the height of the capital, the height of the base. The ionic that we're doing tonight, it has a height of nine diameters. And that makes the uh, entablature two and a quarter diameters tall if it's one fourth of, of nine. And we have seven eighths, six eighths, and, and five eighths. So this is a really nice um, just overall uh, template for how the proportional systems are, are working uh, on uh, with the, the hey, Paul, orders. Uh -huh. I, I have a question for you. As, as a member, do we have access to these plates? Because I know you've shown this before in other primers. Um, Yes, you do, um, and I can I can email them out to you, um, which might be faster than trying to get them from uh, ICA National. So we we can send out uh, a copy of all these plates that go through the the step by step, so you have them for reference. That'd be awesome. Oh, that would be like wonderful. To get a copy. But we can't Unless contact you have a ICA. Go ahead. But we can't contact ICAA and have those sent to us as well. That's true. Yeah, and they're constantly they're they're working on updating it. So this is a kind of a living document um, as they develop it more and more. Um, but the other publication that you can get very cheap is the American Vignola. You can there are many different authors that wrote you know and drew the proportions and slightly different systems. But this book here, the American Vignola Guide to Making Classical Architecture, um, you can you can actually uh, find this on like Google Books uh, for free, or you can uh, buy a copy of it. And that's what the ICA plates are based on. So uh, these go through all of the orders and a lot of other things too, the layout of uh, of arches and uh, when you're putting columns together in the composition and and Lots of uh, compositional uh, um, instructions as well. So that's a, a very useful book that we use a lot. Um, if you attended the, the moldings class, these are the shapes that we're going to be using as we're drawing the base and the, the capital next. Um, we have uh, flat moldings, we have curved moldings. So there's the and curved moldings. We have concave, convex, and compound. So these are the these are the molding shapes that we're going to be uh, using. This class is building on that last class of the moldings that we had. So if you didn't take that class and you need a, uh, some help as we go along, or if you get uh, confused, I'm, I I can slow down and help. But these are the names that I'm going to be using: fillet, fascia, splay, cavetto. Ovalo as and et cetera, Saima as as we draw them, we're going to be using the, the names of the moldings. And moldings have both a shape and they have a function. So there's moldings that are at the top that crown something. Uh, they they flare out at the top. There's moldings that support. They tend to curl back underneath as if they're like bearing this weight. They're supporting moldings. And there's moldings at the base that transition from a vertical surface to a horizontal surface. Um, and, and the classical orders are really a composition of moldings. The ionic is a little bit special, uh, more complicated than the Doric because it has that volute, that spiral, which we'll uh, draw here in, in a second. <clears throat> the other function of moldings is to create shade and shadow. At a very fundamental abstract level, that's what architecture does. It, it captures light or obscures light, filters light, and these forms uh, play with the, the light to create interesting uh, shade and shadow. Um, 
the the last thing that I wanted to mention before we move on to the capital and base is that you'll see a great variety of these. And uh, this is the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. Uh, someone mentioned that uh, earlier. This is the interior space of the Joseph Smith Memorial Building. And what you'll notice is that there are very ornate examples of the Ionic. There are very simple examples of the Ionic. This is extremely ornate. It's a Renaissance revival building. Every surface is covered with uh, ornament, uh, pretty much. And it's it's like a you can think of it like DNA. When you start to change the DNA of one element, like the column type, um, it has to run through the entire uh, building. So here's a close-up view of the ornament in those moldings, the gold leaf, the, you know, even down to these uh, little cherubs and uh, flowers. Uh, it's it's very intricate, and these column capitals, they're they're a bit uh, unusual. They're a little bit different from the one that we're going to draw. We're not going to draw something this um, over the top with with ornament, uh, but you'll notice how. Uh, the character uh, runs through all of the elements uh, in a room. So we're going to draw the uh, ionic capital and, and base uh, that will look like this. We're going to do it at a little bit larger scale than our uh, block order drawing so we can actually draw these moldings. And you can do it like this where we put both the base and the capital on a single sheet of paper. Or you can do them on uh, separate sheets, OK? So uh, if we do them on the same sheet of paper, we just make a cut line at some point on the shaft of the column, and then we'll pick it up um, above that with the, uh, with the capital above. I'm going to do it like this, with them stacked on top of each other. but. Um, if you run out of space or you want to just draw them on separate sheets of paper, you can do them uh, like this. Let's go ahead and get started with the base, which is the easier of the two. Uh, this is the first step that we'll have. And, and for this one, to uh, make it a little bit easier as we subdivide into different parts, I'm going to use three inches for the, the width of my column here. So if you want to do that, you can. But remember that these are all proportional. So if you want to draw it big, bigger or, or, or smaller, uh, you're making these uh, different uh, divisions based on proportion. OK, so let's get a, a clean sheet of paper. <clears throat> And let's draw the uh, ionic base. So again, we need to establish a, a square. So uh, if you're using a drafting table, you can do it that way if you're doing it in CAD or something. Um, I'm just going to use my triangle here. To set the, the base. And I'm going to use three inches. this lined up. There we go. I'm going to use uh, three inches for the, the width of my <clears throat> column diameter. So that means uh, over here on the left, I'm going to have three inches. If you think back to that, uh, block order, we divided it all into nine parts. This would be like the last one. 
this is the ninth one. So that's my diameter height and width. And I'm going to take those edges and dash that line up on the left and on the right. So that's defining the edges of my column. If it's, if it's three inches in diameter, that means one and a half inches would be my center line. I need to draw that center line. And I'll use that dash dot for my center line. Now over here, if you remember, the, the height of the base was one half D. So here on the left, I'll take that three inches and divide it in half. So this is one half D. Carry that line across. I'll dash that line too. It's kind of defining the, the boundaries of my base here. So that's what your drawing should look like at this point. In the next step, we're going to start subdividing and then we'll draw our uh, moldings of the base. The base comes out beyond, it's like one of those transitioning moldings where we've got a vertical element and we're transitioning to the ground. It's, we need to like visually show that transition uh, <clears throat> in our molding profiles. So, uh, we're going to divide the width, the diameter, into one, two, three, four, five, six. And we're going to add one of those to each side, right? So it will be eight, six at the furthest point on the edges. And then we're going to take these heights over here and we're going to subdivide those to get the different uh, <clears throat> proportions of our, of our moldings in order to get uh, this ionic column base. Okay, so this is what we're going to do next. Below the column down here, we're gonna, we want to divide this uh, into six. <clears throat> so if you've used uh, three inches, That makes it really easy because we can just do that into halves, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. And then we can add one on either side. And we'll make a proportional ruler down here. with those divisions. So this is eight, six. D. <clears throat> and we'll bring up those two points. Again, just dashing these lines. They aren't hard lines yet. They're just giving us the boundaries. Then over here on the left, we're going to take our base height, this one half D. We're going to divide that into thirds. 
So <clears throat> mine is one and a half inches. I divide that into thirds. Those will each be half an inch. And I'll take that bottom one across. That's going to be the plinth. And then these two here, I'm going to divide that into thirds. So this isn't quite so easy because it's um, <clears throat> one inch that I need to divide into thirds. So I'm going to take uh, a, a different scale, find one that I can divide into three at an angle. There's my one eighth scale. I'm going to divide that three, six. So I've divided that into thirds. The ionic base has this square plinth at the bottom, and then it has a, a, a torus, and then a scotia, a torus, and then it tapers to the, uh, to the column. So um, this is helping us define the, those uh, other molding points. So I'm gonna take <clears throat> that bottom one across. That'll be the height of our torus. And then the remainder, we have these, these two parts. We're going to divide each of those into four. So I'm just going to do this uh, by eye. Dividing into four is pretty easy to do by eye. Divide it in half. Divide it in half again. To the top. And we'll bring across the bottom one. Come up to the next major division here. Bring that one across. And then the next small tick mark, bring that across. That line that you dashed, make that a solid line. And the one just above that. <laughs> so what we'll have, I'm just don't, you don't need to draw this with me. I'll just sketch it in. What we'll have is this plinth, and then we'll have a, a torus here. This will be a fillet. And then the scotia, a fillet, a torus, a fillet, and then the conge that brings it back to the column shaft. So I'm going to draw that more accurately, <clears throat> excuse me, on the right hand side. Okay, let me go back to my slide here. This is what it will look like in the end. <clears throat> It can help if you have a little circle template. You can use that uh, to be more accurate about the curves. Uh, I'm just going to do it uh, freehand, but if you want to be more precise uh, with your curves, you can use a circle template or a, a compass, but it gets uh, quite small. So let's come back to our column. At that Far right edge at uh, what we drew is eight six the diameter. The first molding is a straight fascia. It's called a, the, the plinth. 
and I'll I'll draw them both as we go. So that's the the plinth. I'm going to darken the ground line. <clears throat> and then <clears throat> right here we're going to draw the, a a torus, which is uh, a half round molding. Um, it, it's going to be tangent at the edge. So if you're if you're drafting this and you want to find the center of that circle, you know you can use your your forty five triangle, and you can find the center point of that circle. Right there. And that molding is a, a half round, the torus. So we'll label these as we go the plinth, the torus. And then right at the apex, before it starts curving around, that will be another, uh, that will be a, a fillet. Right, so it's a vertical molding, a fillet. And then we're going to come up to the top and work our way down, and we'll we'll meet that fillet in just a minute. So what we want right here, where the the shaft of our column is coming down, it's going to uh, <clears throat> slide outward in a quarter round in this molding shape that we call a conge. So it's a it's a quarter round molding, right? So. Uh, it's a quarter of a circle. It, it's tangent with the column shaft here. And then where that's tangent with the top of our fillet will come down. And then here we have another torus. So again, if you wanted to, you could, if you're drafting this, you could draw your 45s to find that center point. That's a torus and it has a fillet here. And now we're going to draw, uh, so let's write in these names, fillet. At the top, we had the, the conge and the fillet, a torus. And fill it. And here in the middle, we're going to have this this molding. It's a separating molding. Uh, it means a little shadow, a little cave, called a scotia or scotia in Greek. And we learned how to draw that last time. It's two uh, curves of different radiuses. So it's it starts out as a smaller quarter round. And then it ends as a bigger one. So it's like this, this circle would be small here, and this circle would be larger in, in its uh, radius. But we're going to draw it so it's this shape that changes in radius as it goes from top to bottom. Those are the moldings of our uh, <clears throat> ionic base. Um, Sorry, I was going to draw these on the other side too. I'll finish those. Those would be the same moldings as we had on the right. Our conge, the torus, fillet, scotia, fillet, and torus. Now we can come back and just darken in some of those lines so it's a little bit clearer what we've drawn.
Any questions about the ionic base? It's a little more complicated than the, the Doric base was. But it has this nice rhythm of alternating straight curve, straight curve, straight curve, straight. And it also has a rhythm of this uh, <clears throat> convex, concave, and convex. This is um, a molding pattern that you'll see a lot in classical architecture. It, this is like the base of a, a chess piece, too. They often have this molding. And let's draw the, the column shaft uh, up just a little bit. Remember, it's, it's vertical for the first third. And then we can make a cut line. Put it right there. <laughs> Excuse me, for the top of our uh, face. If you want to, you could go through the steps of, of drawing the flutes in the column. We're not going to do that tonight, but this uh, is the steps to doing that where you would draw the column diameter up here in plan view, and then you would divide that uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, so 12 parts for the one half view, so 24 parts total, and then <clears throat> subdivide those. And it has this alternating uh, flat and then concave, flat and then concave shape in plan that when you uh, extend those lines down, then those would uh, be the flutes of your, of your column. So we're not going to do that tonight, but just if you were curious about uh, how to do a fluted column, those would be the steps. You're working in plan view and then transferring those lines onto your elevation. All right, let's move on to uh, the capital. And I'll just quickly scroll through these steps that we're going to do, where uh, we're at five six the diameter, right? Not the full diameter. And then we're going to subdivide at the top uh, these different uh, moldings of the capital. And then we'll try and, and, and draw the volute. So the volute comes from uh, forms in nature, like the shells or the uncurling of a, uh, uh, a fern or the, uh, the ram's horn. And at a macro level, the uh, you know, shape of galaxies. And at our man-made level, you know, something like a, a spiral staircase, we, we find this form a lot in, in nature. It's complicated to draw. We're going to learn one method to do that, where we're uh, subdividing the, the eye of the, uh, of the volute, and then we're uh, <clears throat> drawing this radius that gets tighter and tighter as it approaches the eye of the uh, volute. So in the end, uh, our column capital will look uh, Something like this, hopefully. We'll see how we do. So let's go back to the beginning and we'll start with uh, step number one. Okay. So we have our base diameter. We know what that is. We made it at three inches. <clears throat> and we need to 
reduce it down to five sixths of the diameter. So <clears throat> right here, just above that, let's make uh, one of our proportional uh, rulers. Divide this into uh, six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And we need to take off one six. We don't want to take it off of one side. We want to take it equally off of uh, both sides. So we'll divide this one into in half and we'll divide that one in half. So that's taking off one twelfth on one side, one twelfth on the other side. Two twelfths is one six. So it gives us five six diameter. Um, <clears throat> So let's dash that line up. So we see that's the far edge, one diameter out there, and this is our five six. In there, let me draw my. proportional ruler. So that's this is the part that we took off. On either side. So that allows for the, the shrinking of the the diameter with our emphasis. We're also over here. Uh, oh. There we go. Uh, over here on the left, we're going to uh, draw the height of our column capital. So I'm going to extend that line. And if you remember, we uh, took the diameter, which is three inches. So our diameter. And then uh, we divided it in, in half and in thirds. We're just gonna show the half right now. So divide that into in half. And you'll take that top line across. That will be the very top of our capital. And then dash. This line across. And let's extend. Our lines on the left and right. To the top. And that's establishing the boundaries of our capital. So back to the slides, you, you can see where we're going next. Uh, this is what we drew the division into one half D for the height of our uh, capital. And we're going to divide that into one, two, three, four, five, six parts. And then subdivide that further down into parts to get all of the heights of, of these moldings as we come down. The overall shape of, of our capital.
So let's do it together. This first uh, overall height, the one half D, let's divide that into uh, six parts. So if you're like me and you had it at uh, three inches for the diameter, you're gonna divide that into six parts. Each of those will be a quarter of an inch. And then we're going to do this division into three again. Each of these we're going to divide into three. So the top one uh, we'll divide into three. You can measure this out or you can do it by eye. One, two, three. We're going to divide uh, all of these into three until we get to the bottom one. One, two, three. And we'll leave that bottom one. We don't need that one. <clears throat> and let's pull some of these lines over and draw our moldings as we go so <clears throat> this bottom division here this bottom one uh, <clears throat> that one is going to be uh, a fillet so just like we did at the, the base, the shaft of the column comes up into a conge and then a fillet here. We'll skip this one, go to the next one. That will be the height of our uh, torus, which is the next molding. So this is a torus here. So this the center point of that would be this one in the middle here, right? If we were to pull that across, that would be the, the center. Right. Maybe a little more accurate there of that little torus. The next major line uh, we're going to draw is up here. It's it's not this one, but it's the next one down from that right here. Pull that line across. And this is going to be an ovalo molding, which is a quarter round. So the center of that quarter round, if you're drawing it with a, a compass, would be directly above it. And it's going to be the same distance here as it is out to the side. I'm going to see if I can draw that with my compass. Pretty small, but let's give it a try. And then let's we'll we'll start at the top and we'll come down to to meet that edge. We're going to start out here at our line that was the full diameter width. <clears throat> um, 
we're going to bring across the top division. That'll be a fillet. We'll skip one, bring in the next one. That'll be a Sima reversa. The next one will be a fillet. And then it'll be a conge coming back to this top edge. So <clears throat> from here, from that point right there, we want the a Sima reversa, which we're going to put on a, a, as a 45 in uh, proportion. So it's a, like a little square in proportion. That will be the outside edge of the top fillet. And this is a, a Sima reversa, which if you remember, it's this compound curve where you have a convex and then concave shape. So it looks like that, convex and then concave. It's like uh, two quarter circles. And then we have a, a fillet here and the, the conge that comes back. to meet the top of this oval up. Those are the moldings. Those are the shapes of the moldings. Uh, a lot of them get covered up uh, by the volutes in our drawing, but those are the moldings that come around and they're, they're going uh, back behind the volutes. And so we, we'll draw those so that we would be able to sculpt or construct this uh, capital. And <clears throat> we need to find, we're gonna to attempt to draw this um, a volute and we need to know the location of the eye. That's really important uh, because everything's gonna spring out of that eye. It's like, um, you can think of it like an egg, you know, with. Uh, life emerging from it. Um, <clears throat> the the height of that eye, or the location of that eye, the height is going to be uh, from here to here. So we can dash in those lines. It's the, the center point of that torus. This is going to define the bottom edge of the eye. And then you skip one of the divisions and <clears throat> that next point is the top of our eye. So that's the size of it. And it's going to be lined up exactly with the edge of our diameter at the bottom. So the full diameter width of the column, that's going to be the eye of the volute. So I can draw um, these moldings up here to where I'm going to uh, start the volute as well. So again, this would be a 45, a fillet, Sima uh, reversa, and then uh, a, a fillet right here. The tangent to uh, the outside diameter of the column. Anybody need more time on that? That was pretty complicated to get there, but uh, these are the moldings of the, the ionic capital before we draw the, the volute, which is the, really the, the most challenging part of our drawing tonight. So I wanna make sure everybody's caught up and, and prepared. That's going to be the very center of it. If we're ready to go, we'll move right into it. The volute, if you were to enlarge 
that eye of the volute <clears throat> until it was really large. Um, there are, are many different ways to construct it. I don't know if any of you are, are furniture makers um, or if you've ever done uh, ornament uh, or stone carving. Uh, the volute is a common shape that you see in, in furniture and in decorative patterns. Uh, it all, all uh, emerges from the geometry uh, in the center. And the way that we would do it if we were being very exact, um, and there's even more exact ways than this, but if you were to enlarge that eye to a, a much bigger scale, draw a diagonal through the center of the eye in both directions, and then a square that is uh, crossing the horizontal and vertical axes. And we took those, uh, I mean, you can see, you saw how tiny it was on my page. We're not going to be able to draw it at this kind of accuracy. But if you were to enlarge it much bigger, um, and then you took those uh, diagonals and you divided them into three, and you started marking these points going around from one, two, three, and four, where the diagonal crosses that square. And then you come in one point, five, six, seven, eight, come in another point, nine, 10, 11, and 12. Those would be the center points of your arcs. So you can see um, here at the bottom, this diagram where we would put the point of our compass at one and the pencil of our compass at the top here and draw one quarter turn, then move the point of our compass to two uh, and then shorten the uh, compass so we'd uh, make the radius a little bit smaller and draw the next quarter arc, move the point of our compass to three. Each time it's spiraling inwards towards the center, three, four, five, six, seven, all the way until we got to the center. Um, and then we would need to offset that in order to do it again, because the, the volute isn't just a line, it's actually a flat surface. It's that fillet that comes all the way around and then resolves into the eye in the center. So we would offset all of those a little bit and then do it all again and draw each of those uh, quarter turns. So I've got, I want to show this, um, Kind of in, in a slide sequence at a even at a larger scale to show you what I'm talking about. And we're we're going to approximate this the best that we can. But we would start by placing the point of our compass at uh, point number one and <clears throat> putting the pencil at the top where the top edge of that fillet comes, turning the compass a quarter turn, then moving the point of the compass here to point two and shrinking the size, turning it to the next quadrant. Again, each time that compass gets a little bit smaller, each time that you turn it, you can see how the radius is, is decreasing. And we get back to the beginning and now we moved. So we did point one, two, three, and four, and we're going to move to point five. So <laughs> this is the Next turn, again, each time getting a little bit smaller and smaller until we uh, reach the, the center on the 12th turn. Um, so we're going to give it a try. We're obviously not going to be able to um, do it with that kind of accuracy, but we don't want a big uh, sloppy, um, messy spiral either. Let's try and do it as, as carefully as we can. We'll use our compass and uh, try to draw this uh, volute that sp spirals towards uh, the center. Okay, so the... <clears throat> the shape of this volute is going to be created by this fillet right here. 
So I, I drew that as a hard edge, but I actually don't want that to be a hard edge. I want this fillet to come across And then I want that to become the, the volute as it goes around. So if you if you recall, <clears throat> we're going to take the, uh, I'm going to enlarge this for you. I'm going to zoom in on my camera here, see if I can get a little closer. Do your best, guys. This gets really tiny. Uh, <clears throat> If you remember that little eye is here and I had uh, diagonal lines and it had those points of the compass. Let's see if I can focus a little bit. It had those points, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, along those diagonals. So the first one is going to be at the top left. Uh, the diagram that I showed you was doing the, the spiral on the left, and the one on the right is just going to be the reverse. So we put the point at where that would be, approximate uh, point number one. Open up your compass to the top edge of the fillet, and we're going to come around one quarter turn. And then we move the compass point to the top right of our circle of the eye, right there. And so now your, your compass opening, that radius should be a little bit smaller than it was on the first quarter turn. Each time we're moving to the next quadrant of the circle. So now we're at the bottom right. And our compass is getting a little bit smaller. And then we have a quarter turn. Oh, try that again. Got to make sure that the point of the compass is, has a nice grip on the paper. The next one is the bottom left. And when we get back up to the top, uh, you'll see how far we've oh, did it again. We'll see how far we've come down from the first point. And we need to go around again. So we're gonna to come to the top left, but in just a little bit towards the center. And this is where it starts to get uh, almost too small for uh, our instruments. Move the compass over. Reduce our radius again. Quarter turn. Quarter turn. Move the point of the compass to the uh, bottom left. Quarter turn. And we've just got uh, one more spiral to go. Um, 
my compass is almost at its limit of how small it can go. You may have a compass that can get a little bit tighter, but that's about it for me with my compass. The rest of it, I'm going to uh, freehand another turn and it should meet the eye about at the top of that last turn. Now, if we were uh, drawing this with extreme accuracy, we would use the compass again and we would just offset that. So we would bring our, our point back into the, the eye and we would open it up to uh, the bottom edge of that fillet. And we would do the same thing from the top left to the top right, bottom right, and bottom left. But uh, for our purposes tonight, I'm going to freehand that second line. And this line actually does. Uh, taper in so it gets gradually thinner and thinner as it spirals around. Until it meets there in the center. How did you do? Everybody? Follow along with that. You can come back and, and clean it up a little bit. That's the ionic volute. Um, so what we're showing in this drawing of the ionic column on the right hand side is what you see on, on the surface and on the left hand side are the moldings that are behind that. So we could over here uh, on the left, we could just kind of dash in or, or lightly draw the, the volute so you can we can see that. So let's bring that I would be right here, right? And you can look at the one on the on the right, and we can do our best to uh, to draw just lightly uh, <clears throat> the shape of that. So we have this uh, outer spiral. that comes up to uh, about here on the next turn. And it's slowly creeping in towards the middle and then comes down to about there. So we're just drawing it in reverse here on the left-hand side, just sketching it in. So we can reveal what's happening behind it on the left. I need that one looks a, to be a little bit wider. Okay. And Then what you see when you actually look at the, the capital, what's not hidden by these volutes is, are these moldings as they come across between the two volutes. So we had this fillet at the bottom. We'll see that. And then we'll see this uh, torus.
we'll see the top edge of the ovalo. And we'll see this fillet, which then becomes, you know, that becomes the volute on the other side. Try to draw that a little bit more carefully. And then that's the edge of the, the shaft of our column there, which uh, has that emphasis. So it's slowly uh, curving out. It's not vertical. It's slowly curving out towards the base, whereas the full diameter, it's five, six, the diameter at the top. So show that sloping outward. And then we'll draw a cut line for the column capital. And <clears throat> Let's go ahead and label our, our moldings here as well, like we did on the base. So we have uh, a fillet. We have the Sima uh, reversa, a fillet. This is the conge, the ovalo. And then a torus, a fillet, and conge to the straight uh, shaft. So you'll notice that this conge here, that's what's going to be uh, the shape of the inside between the fillet. It has this curving profile to it at the top. So it will catch the, the light and that, that channel, that curving channel um, goes around where the, the top edge is a fillet is that flat profile. And then in here, it's like scooped out. Any questions about the ionic capital? Thank you for explaining uh, those quarter turns on the volute that really did it for me. Um, there are other methods, and you know, if you're doing computer software, CAD or something, um, really what you want is a constantly diminishing radius as you're going around but this is uh, good enough for the eye to do that quarter turn and then change the radius quarter turn uh, your your eye smooths out the change in radius as you go around um, and that's a very uh, it's a complicated shape it's a more advanced shape in woodworking or stone carving uh, but you may have a, you know a project where you have a shape like that some decorative ornament and you want to be able to communicate to the fabricator uh, how to do it so this is this is a method for uh, getting that to be uh, quite accurate and a beautiful just uh, slowly tapering curve Let's talk a little bit about the ionic and uh, a couple of problems that the ionic has. Uh, it, it has uh, given people headaches throughout history for uh, a, a certain reason that I, I want to uh, talk to you about, and then we'll do the entablature. 
So uh, the Ionic capital, unlike the Doric capital, it has a front and a side, right? The, the side of the Ionic uh, capital looks different uh, from the front. And you can see that here in this uh, image. Uh, <clears throat> This, this capital here, here's the uh, volutes that we drew. On the side, it's like the side uh, view of a scroll. And this presents a problem when you're using the Ionic order. Unlike the Doric order here on the right, which has the same shape, the same look to the side and the front, uh, the Ionic, when it turns a corner, particularly on the inside corner of, say, a courtyard. What do you do with that? Um, this was one uh, Renaissance architect's solution uh, where you've got these ionic columns coming this way and ionic columns coming the other way, and they kind of collide here <clears throat> in, in the center with a rather uh, unsatisfactory uh, capital at the corner where those uh, volutes are like bent in, in half. So the, the Ionic has the, this uh, corner problem. Um, here's another example, a Greek example uh, on the outside corner where the, the, uh, the capital is here on the front. Uh, they wanted to face the front and the capitals on the side, they wanted to face outward. And so what do you do with this corner capital? Well, the Greeks came up with the solution where if this is a plan view, cutting through that capital and looking up at it. You can see how they took that corner volute and kind of uh, bent it and curved it outward so that it appears like the, a front on this side and a front on, uh, on that side. Um, <clears throat> Every one of the classical orders uh, has some things about it that are tricky as a designer. And, and as you uh, get into the details, it's never as easy as it seems. Um, there have been uh, lots of proposals for how to fix this. The, the, uh, uh, the Joseph Smith Memorial Building that we looked at earlier actually has an interesting uh, capital where all of those volutes are bent. So all four of them kind of curve out and, and bend so that it doesn't matter where the capital is, you don't have a different one in the corner, uh, whether it's on the inside or the outside. And that was a Renaissance uh, invention to try and solve this problem inherent in the Ionic order. But the entablature is pretty straightforward. Unlike the Doric order that had these triglyphs that have to be lined up with the capitals, um, and it was kind of tricky to draw this frieze in the Ionic order, the frieze is completely, uh, uh, is just a flat fascia. It's free from any of those complicated ornaments that the Doric order had. The architrave is fairly simple. It's a fascia and then a step, a fascia, and then some moldings at the top. The frieze is that flat fascia. And then the cornice has a, a series of moldings. This is called the, the bed mold down here. Then it has these dentals. We'll draw the dentals, uh, an ovolo, and then um, the corona that sticks out, and at the top of the, the cymatium. All right. Let's just uh, get a new sheet of paper and get our drawing set up for the last one of the evening. And we should finish a little bit early. So I blocked out uh, four hours for this class, but I think we can probably finish in about, uh, about 45 minutes or an hour. We'll probably wrap up in a, about then. <clears throat> so this is the first step that we'll do with the entablature. Um, <clears throat> we're not going to redraw the capital, but I just want to emphasize the relationship between the entablature and the capital, because um, this is often a, 
a point where uh, you see buildings that are not very careful about this de this detail, and it's one that is important that this line of structure of the column and the entablature uh, stays vertical. So the outside edge of this architrave, we want to align that with the neck of our column. We don't want that to be out here um, or in here. We, we want it to the, the line of structure visually to carry down through the column. So <clears throat> the first thing that we'll do is we'll take this overall height of the entablature and we'll divide it like we did in our block order into 18 parts, five, six, and seven. All right. New sheet of paper. <clears throat> and step number one. Drawing the ionic entablature. Uh, let's use the same diameter of the column that we did for the capital and the base. So if you'll uh, remember that the, the, the width of the column, the diameter of the column was uh, three inches. And then the we took the entablature to the column was uh, was one to four, right? So <coughs> the entablature ended up being uh, two and a quarter uh, diameters. So on the left hand side, we're going to draw two and a quarter diameters. So one diameter is three inches. And the next diameter is. Uh, would be to the six inches. <laughs> and we need a, a quarter uh, of three inches. So let's just calculate that. A quarter of three inches would be three quarters of an inch, right? So it's 0.75. So that is going to be the height of our entablature, six and three quarters inches. We'll take the bottom edge across and the top edge across. Those are the outer limits of our entablature. And we need to divide that into uh, 18 parts. So find a, a scale that you can divide into 18. It's not so easy. Unless you use the three inches and then it's pretty easy. One of these will, will line up uh, with 18. Which one is it? That one that I had was Good enough. Three sixteenths inch scale. <clears throat> we'll give you zero at the top and thirty six at the bottom. So uh, every two will make a mark <clears throat> to divide it into eighteen. Actually, I'm gonna. Sorry, I'm gonna come back over. Here. Let's do it at the at the edge for a proportional ruler. So every two, I'm making a mark to divide it into 18. So that's 18 parts. And if you'll re recall, the cornice was seven. Actually, let's start at the bottom. Let's start at the architrave. The architrave was five. One, two, three, four, five.
the threes was six, one, two, three, four, five, six. And that leaves seven for the corners. So we're, we're roughly dividing it into thirds, but we're giving a little emphasis to the cornice and, and the frieze and the architrave is a little bit uh, narrower. So there's kind of this growth uh, <clears throat> with the ionic from the architrave to the frieze to the cornice. And let's also draw the center line of our column. So we need to make sure that we have enough room to get the full uh, cornice. The cornice comes out at a 45 degree angle. So we don't want to run out of space on our paper. So let's let's bring that cornice down. That'll be the edge of the freeze. And, and the architrave. <clears throat> we just need to make sure that we have uh, enough room uh, for that. And then if you'll recall, uh, we had, <clears throat> we divided um, the diameter of the column, which was three down to five, six, which came in All right, so we divided into six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and then took uh, a twelfth off on each side. And that's what's going to line up with our architrave. All right, let me move that up a little bit. So I'm I'm putting the edge of the architrave at two and three quarters, and then this would be the full diameter, the three inches. And this would be the center line here at one and a half. So let's draw the center line of our column up. We won't draw that column capital down here, but you could uh, if you wanted, and the uh, the edge of that column shaft at the top would be right here, aligned with the architrave. All right, so we've made the major divisions of the architrave, uh, which is uh, five parts, the frieze, let's draw them on the other side. Architrave is five parts, six parts, seven parts, and we'll, we'll write those in architrave, the freeze and the cornice. And all that's really left to do is to draw the moldings, we'll do some subdivisions and, and draw those moldings. Okay. <clears throat> we'll go through these one at a time. So we'll do the, the architrave first, and then we'll come up and we'll do the um, the cornice at the top. And the freeze is really easy. It's just uh, a fascia. Sometimes it has a curved profile to it. They call it a pulvinated freeze. So I'll show you how to draw that as well. But we'll make these divisions as we go, and then we'll add the moldings and do the dentals. So let's start with the, the architrave down here where we have this, we'll have a fascia and then at the top, it'll have a little molding and then another fascia and then a molding at the top of that, at the division between the architrave and the frieze. So coming back to our drawing. Let me get that to focus a little better. There we go. The moldings of the architrave, to get those, 
we're going to take this first. So we've got five parts. Let's let's start from the bottom and and work our way up. We're going to take this uh, second one here. We'll divide that into two parts. So divide that in half. And take the upper one of those and divide that into thirds. So let's bring those across. <clears throat> we need to bring this one across right here. That will be the top of that fascia. And then we're going to bring this one across. So we'll have a little fillet and then an ovalo to bring that next tick mark across. That will be our fillet. And then this top one across. And let's go ahead and draw those in darker. We have a fascia that aligns with the column shaft. And then it steps out as a little fillet and an ovalo. So that's a quarter round. Come back over to the left hand side, and we need to take this top one of our five parts and we'll divide that into three. <clears throat> and take the top one across. and the bottom. Where you ended the ovalo down here at the bottom, we're gonna step that out and then carry the second uh, fascia up. to that point that we found. <clears throat> and what we want with this molding at the top of the architrave is a projection at square in proportion. So we're gonna take our 45 triangle, draw that line uh, up from the face, uh, of the architrave and where that crosses here that will be a fillet so that's the outer edge of that fillet and then we have a cyma reversa molding that brings us back to that fascia And then the freeze is all the way back at the same plane that the architrave started at. <clears throat> so those are the profiles of the uh, ionic architrave. It's a fascia, a fillet, an ovalo, a fascia, cyma reversa, and then another fillet.
So it kind of has this the, the largest molding at the top, this sort of uh, terminating molding at the top, and then a little supporting molding under that first fascia. And the frieze is one simple fascia, or it can be curved. And to draw the curve, <clears throat> the way that we find that shape of the curve, it's going to be out here somewhere, like a little belly. Um, but rather than just freehanding it, a way that we can find it is <coughs> taking our compass. And you open up the compass to the height of the breeze. We're going to come over here and strike an arc. Bring the point to the top of the freeze. Oh. Open that up to the height of the, the freeze and strike another arc. And where those meet, where those two arcs cross, I'm going to put the point of our compass there. And we'll see how well I did with my sketch. Look at that. Not bad. If you have a, a freeze that has this curve to it, that's going to be um, the shape. And, and uh, the ionic sometimes has that. The, the freeze, if you remember in the Joseph Smith Memorial Building, was highly decorated, had all of that ornament, the cherubs and flowers and all of that. Um, Sometimes it just gets this belly kind of suggesting that it's bearing all of this weight. And that's the uh, that's the freeze. Then we'll move up into uh, the cornice, which has a lot more moldings. But if uh, we just follow the, the subdivisions and uh, do these carefully, it should be pretty straightforward. Let's starting uh, at the bottom. Okay, take this bottom division. And we're going to divide that into five parts. So one, two, three, four, five. And we'll carry across the top one and that first little fifth division. Coming up from there. Take that next division here. We'll bring that across and bring the next one across as well. So we've brought three more division lines across. We're going to take this one and divide that into five. One, two, three, four, five. And the next one up here, we'll divide that just in half. We want a, a larger molding there. So this one was five, this one was five, this one is just two. <clears throat> Bring across that bottom edge, then take across both of these in the middle. And then come up here to this one that we divided in half.
and bring that across as well. And the last ones we'll subdivide. We're going to do these uh, top two. The top one will divide in thirds. The next one will divide in two. And then we're actually going to divide that one again into three. So we did this one thirds, that one in half. And then we took that bottom one, divided it in half, or divided into thirds, excuse me. <clears throat> And these are the lines we'll pull across. We'll take that bottom edge. We'll take these two. So we have a tiny little fillet there. And then this top third. bring that one across. Those are all the divisions that we need to draw the uh, ionic cornice. So we've gotten this far, we've made all of these divisions here, and uh, now we're going to turn those into actual molding profiles. <clears throat> so starting at the at the bottom, We'll have a cyma reversa, and then we'll have these uh, dental moldings, and we'll look at how to draw those. And then we have a, a fillet, the ovalo, this big uh, horizontal fascia and a vertical fascia, then a cyma reversa, and fillet underneath our final uh, cyma recta. So this is like the very top, the crowning molding at the top that's going to meet that 45 degree angle. So all of these moldings you can see kind of follow along the, uh, the 45 as we go up. So coming back to our drawing here, uh, let's, Let's start at the bottom. We have a cyma re reversa that's going to go from um, here to here. And it's going to end at the point where the 45 crosses our line. So we have a cyma reversa. If you want to do it with a compass or a circle template, you can, or just freehand it. That cyma reversa, if you <clears throat> remember, it's like this section, uh, one, one quarter section of these two circles, one stacked on, on top of the other. So if you were to, if you wanted to draw that, you'd put the, with a compass, you'd put the point of your compass right here, point of your compass right there, and you draw that quarter circle, draw that quarter circle. And then a little fillet. And uh, now we need to draw these dentals. We're going to come, uh, we want one of the dentals to be centered on our column. And we want the other one to meet that point right there. So we're going to uh, divide that distance. into uh, 10 parts. So we need to find a scale that we can easily divide into 10. From the, from the center line of our column to there, we're gonna divide that into 10. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 
10. Take those lines down. And make a little proportional ruler here. The dentals are the trickiest part of the entablature. And this this top edge here of of this division that we made. That's going to be the the underside of these dentals, um, and it's going to alternate. So uh, there's going to be uh, one of these on the other side too. The same same distance. Sorry, that that same distance you'll carry across. <clears throat> um, and this edge right here is going to be the space in between the dental. So we're going to bring the dental up to that uh, <clears throat> line that we made. And the dental is going to be uh, two of those. And the space between is going to be one. So we did the, the division into 10. The dental is every two, and the space between is one. And the dentals, uh, they're like a square, they're, they're like a fascia, right? The, 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 the face of those is flat. And then in between back here behind them, there's a square. So, uh, This face is further out than than that one back there, which is further out than than that one. So let's and and maybe I can go back to a, a photograph so we can see what those look like. But let's bring across these lines. So so that bottom edge of the fillet we're going to see, and then the dentals. We we only see that line where we have the dental, and then this is all at the same plane as that fillet back here. So I'm just going to shade that to make that clear. That's all at one plane. And then let's say this is plus one, and this is plus two in terms of like the depth of it coming out at you. And there's often another one of those square blocks here. And then above that is a fillet. That's going to meet the corner where that 45 is carried up. And here at the corner where the dentals turn the corner and go back the other way, you often get a little ornament. Uh, you'll see things like a, an acorn or a, a pineapple or something. So um, you, could, you could sketch that in if you'd like. You have a round shape that turns the corner sometimes. Um, let's go back to our PowerPoint and uh, see if we can find an example of that. I think in the Joseph Memorial Building, nope, there weren't any dentals there. Um, here's an example with the, the Doric order that had uh, that had dental moldings here. So you can see those and the shape that they are. Um, 
I don't think I have a, uh, another photograph of of the dental moldings, but you've seen them before. You can buy a dental molding at any um, lumber yard. Uh, it's a very common uh, molding, but this is the position where it occurs uh, on the ionic entablature. Where we had the, this was called the, the bed mold. It's a cyma reversa in shape. Then we have the dentals. A fillet. And uh, now we're here in the home stretch. So the next one is going to be uh, an ovalo. Can I ask you a question, Paul? Please. Before you go on. Um, Earlier, you had showed where the the oddity of the corner problem with the ionic and one guy created an inside corner and one guy created this really weird looking composite uh, on the Capitol. Well, yeah. on that same picture that you described, I was uh, rather, uh, you know, didn't like the inside corner of the dental. It was sort of a void as opposed to a solid. And uh, I was wondering if there was any rule of thumb in correcting that problem, or at least what I put. Yeah, see the void there in the inside corner? This oh, that's one a mutual, right? Yeah, so this entablature is a little bit different from what we're drawing. These uh, these are these little brackets. These, um, they're sometimes called medallions. Um, uh -huh. The, the mutual blocks are in the Doric. They're these things uh, up underneath the underside of the corona. Uh, but okay, these, so I'm uh, misreading that. That's not a dental feature right there. Uh, they, uh, they're they larger in scale than dentals. Uh, they're like these little brackets in this case. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that, that inside corner, again, yeah, I, the way they space them, they just kiss, they just touch at the corner there um yeah and and often you'll see a sculptural element right there in the corner too to kind of um soften well, that that's sort of what i'm suggesting mm -hmm. is that that void in there is sort of a setup for a problem i would much rather uh prefer uh, some sort of a a corner like you say a sculpt item or you know a pineapple water on the inside there you know what i mean i was wondering if there's any room for thumb yeah, absolutely. That is uh, a place where you often see where where two things come together. These intersections at corners are often treated differently than all this repeating. You have some repeated element, and then at the corner it gets some emphasis. Yeah, um, and uh, trying to turn the corner in a more graceful way. Yeah, uh, but you. you can see in in this time here. Um, like this little acorn or pine cone uh, mm -hmm. element. So that's what we've got here. That's what I'm suggesting that you can put at the corner. Well, I think the inside corner is a different problem than an outside corner. You know what it I mean? Is. Uh huh. It is. And um, if you're not careful, it's it's like laying out stones or bricks too in a building uh, those inside corners and outside corners or, or laying out tile in a bathroom I mean, those can really be a problem if you end up with some tiny little sliver um, mm -hmm. of material so you you really have to think about the the distance and lay out your uh, dentals carefully the idea mm -hmm. is if you can land a dental that's centered right over the column center line well, that's not mm -hmm. always, not always possible, but you know if you're the kind of perfectionist that when you put the uh, the plate over an electrical switch and you make sure that each one of the screws is perfectly vertical, then uh -huh. Uh -huh. You know, you'll you'll be careful when you uh, nail up your dental molding that it's perfectly centered over your column. Yeah. Uh, that's yeah. the kind of OCD that. Uh, we get into with classical architecture. Well, it depends uh, on your client too. Some if people pay more, they demand more. 
Oh, absolutely. There are people who would uh, make you rip it out and redo it if you didn't weren't perfect about it. Yeah. Uh, working our way to the top of the cornice, the next one is is an ovalo, which is that quarter round, right? So if you were drawing this with your your compass, you'd put the point right here, and you'd draw one quarter circle. There's an ovalo, and then we're going to start at the top and come down and, and meet that ovalo. So at the very top, this small division is a fillet. And then we've got the uh, sima recta, which is this uh, compound curve of a, a convex and concave shape. A fillet. Then our uh, we have a sima reversa. So this is a sima uh, recta. This is a fillet. Sima reversa. And then <clears throat> that sima reversa meets back with our forty five. And we're going to drop a vertical. From that point down to the top of our oval, though, I need to carry that line over a little bit. And this is this is called the uh, corona. on on residential construction. Uh, it's often called the, the soffit and fascia. And then this sima represents like the gutter shape. So you'll find gutters that are basically that same shape, uh, sima uh, recta. Uh, <clears throat> and the corona is that part of the, the eaves and the, uh, of the building, the, the soffit and, and the fascia. So it sheds the water away from the building. That's why the cornice uh, projects out. Is it's functional as well as, uh, you know, beautiful. So you can have a cornice, and I find it really interesting looking at a lot of new buildings that are going up. Uh, the way that they kind of abstract this idea of a cornice to just one big, uh, like pancake shape, one big projecting uh, flat surface that sticks way uh, out from the building. Uh, but uh, in, in the classical orders, that projecting uh, cornice is a series of moldings, the bed mold, uh, the dentals, fillet, ovalo, up to the uh, corona, which projects out, and then it has this, this crown to it. And you can often find like that exact crown shape with a little sima reversa, fillet, and sima recta. Uh, you can go to... Uh, Home Depot or Lowe's and find that exact molding right there that we drew. So all of these could be constructed out of uh, pieces of uh, of wood, right? In in section, if we were to draw these as like uh, moldings that you would buy at a at a hardware store, right? Each of these um, is going to be pieces that are. Uh, probably purchased separately and then nailed up with some blocking back behind it. But this all could be carved out of uh, stone. You could do this out of metal. Uh, these moldings can be done in a lot of different materials. They could be molded uh, out of terracotta or, or something else. Um, but the uh, this rhythm of uh, curved, flat, curved, flat, curved, flat, Curve flat, curve flat, just like we saw with the the base. That's a, a rhythm, uh, a cadence of molding profiles that you find in classical architecture. These compositions where uh, it tries to avoid things that are static and repetitive. It tries to avoid equal, equal, equal. So you know, that's that's why we're dividing in slightly different ways. Uh, proportioning things so that there is a, a nice melody uh, uh, of molding shapes. 
if this were, say, uh, you know, a, a song or a symphony um, or a poem, there's a nice cadence, a nice rhythm to the shapes as they go from the, the architrave, the frieze, uh, and the cornice. Um, I, I will leave you with this beautiful image of a, a building in Buenos Aires, Argentina, with a very inventive ionic uh, capital um, and some really beautiful ornament. Um, <clears throat> there's our dental moldings. Look at those, they're, they're up there. They're really tiny. You can just see uh, them at the underside of this uh, cornice. And this cornice has brackets underneath it. It sticks out quite far. But these ionic capitals are actually uh, combined with some leaves from the Corinthian capital. So they're like a composite capital and uh, have these flutes in, in the pilasters, uh, beautiful stone carving in the brackets and uh, keystones and these uh, garlands, quite uh, ornate and beautiful work uh, from our friends in South America. You can find beautiful examples of the Ionic order all over the, the world. We have many here in the United States in our own backyard and uh, encourage you to uh, appreciate each one for its uh, uniqueness, for its beauty, um, and uh, encourage you to uh, follow us on social media, Classes Utah, um, if you would like to get notified about uh, future events and classes that we have coming up. I really appreciate everyone's time here with me tonight. Thanks for spending a Friday night with me learning the moldings and the uh, parts of the ionic order. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you very much, Paul. Hey, uh, how would we get those step-by-step uh, -step slides from you or a, a we'll, PDF? We'll, we'll email them out to you. If you registered for this class, we'll, we'll send a copy to everybody. Thank you very much, sir. You're welcome. Great class. Yep. Have a good evening, everybody. Take care. Have a good weekend. Take care. Good night. Thank you.